Welcome everyone. My name is Mike Leventhal. I'm the Executive Director of the Israel Guide Dog Center. And I just want you to thank you for joining us. Uh, normally we hold this event in Palm Springs where Helen Varen uh, started a memorial to her grandson, Matthew. Uh, this is the 10th annual uh, event, but because of the pandemic, we've had to hold it virtually. Uh, Helen once told me that Matthew was fiercely independent. And when she found out about how guide dogs provide mobility and independence to our clients, she felt that it would be a good match and a good way to honor Matthew's memory. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about how this program is gonna to go today. We're gonna to begin with welcome remarks from Helen. After that, I'm gonna introduce our special guest star, Loretta Swit. She'll only give us a brief hello. Uh, we'll be coming back to Loretta at the end of the program for a long Q&A session. Uh, by the way, you'll be able to type into the chat uh, questions and answers. Um, after that, we're going to have a short six-minute film from Israel uh, about the work we're doing at the center. Then we're going to go to uh, Debbie, who's with, with her guide dog in Israel live. Uh, she will also answer questions for a few minutes. And then we'll close out with Loretta um, and her Q&A session. Uh, now, to begin the program, I'd like to introduce Helen. Um, okay. Helen is a no-nonsense businesswoman, and when she first heard about us, the first thing she did was got on a plane and came to Israel to see for herself what we do. Uh, she was very impressed with the center. She went back to Palm Springs, uh, looked us up on Charity Navigator and GuideStar, saw that we had outstanding ratings, and decided to adopt us as her project. Uh, since we began, uh, this is now one of the anticipated events in Palm Springs. We now have usually about 250 people at her uh, luncheon, and she has raised over $950,000 in a short amount of time. And although she's uh, uh, very young and spry, we told her that she's got to keep doing this at least until she's 120. So now I'd like to turn it over to Helen to say a few words and to, to welcome you all. Thank you. Helen? Hello. I'm on. <laughs> I would like to say welcome. And I want to thank you for all your generosity and support. You have been wonderful and I love you for it. So, um, I don't have a speech written down, but I'm just going to tell you briefly how I got involved with the guide dogs. Uh, I happened to go to Israel with a friend and um, as she suggested, I see the guide dogs. And I said, wonderful, we went. And I was so impressed. It's amazing the way they train these dogs to be eyes and ears for people. How they train them to go to air raid shelters, to stores, to walk in traffic. It gives them life, it really does. So anyhow, it was, of course, it was much smaller than it is now. And oh God, those dogs are so darling. So anyhow, uh, I decided that maybe I could start a program here in Palm Springs in honor of my grandson, who I adored, and who died at a very young age, unfortunately, 21. Anyhow, um, it started out with just 20 people in my home. And then little by little, year by year, we grew. We had a golf tournament uh, with the blind golfer from Israel, uh, who's had five holes in one. I've never had one, but anyhow, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he was amazing. It really was something to play with him. And uh, with Yonik Perez, it was the president's son, who's a veterinarian in Israel. Um, and I've met so many wonderful people, but mostly 
the people here in Palm Springs, I belong to Tamaris Country Club, and the support I've had from Tamaris Country Club has been amazing. But people outside of the club have been amazing too. I thank you so much for all you've done to help me. And I do hope you'll continue. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so enjoy the program. And I thank you so much. It's, uh, this is a heartwarming deal. Anyhow, I'm going to turn you over to Mike now, because I think I've spoken enough. Ta-ta for now. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you, Helen, for your very kind words. Uh, now I'd like to introduce a woman who needs no introduction, a star with many talents and someone who still comes into my home on a regular basis, because every time I see a MASH rerun, I can't pass it by. I've got to turn it back on. Uh, Loretta has earned two Emmy Awards for her portrayal as uh, Major Margaret Houlihan. Uh, she came to us from an introduction from Phyllis Eisenberg, and Phyllis had heard that Loretta was a very active animal rights activist, and Phyllis decided to put us together, and uh, that's how we began our relationship. So thank you, Phyllis, for that lovely introduction. Uh, we all know Loretta from MASH, but she's a multi-talented performer. She's done a lot of work since then and is also a, an animal rights activist, a published author, and artist. Loretta invited us to meet one of our clients in New York at a vegan restaurant. As a matter of fact, it was uh, this young lady here, Ruth and her dog Roxy, that met Loretta. Uh, Ruth, you'll remember, came to Palm Springs one year and is the young lady who lost her vision while giving birth to her son. So Loretta was so taken with Ruth and Roxy that she actually painted a portrait of Roxy and then donated it to us and we auctioned it off. So she's truly connected to our program. Um, and I'm privileged and honored to introduce now Loretta, who will speak to us for just a minute. And then we're going to come back to her for an extended Q&A later. Loretta, please join us. Okay, here I am and hello and thank you, Michael, for those kind words. And yes, I remember uh, meeting you and Roxy <laughs> uh, like it was yesterday. We had so much fun. We took some pictures and um, of course I am a pushover uh, for dogs, any breeds, but these animals, these working animals who help us and an organization like yours who gives the help to people who need it. And uh, I just, um, uh, I love you all so much for the work you're doing. And I'm so thrilled to be a small part of it. I would like to continue to paint more for uh, the organization and, and you know, maybe do a, an art show or something, raise funds, keep us going. And uh, Helen, how dare you look so beautiful. And, uh, and no one's ever going to leave you. You can put that thought out of your mind. Everyone will always stick with you. Uh, I'm, I just am I'm thrilled to be here and doing this and um, getting, getting the word out about us, teaching everybody how valuable the work is, the dogs are, the, uh, the, working, the working animals, uh, what they give us. We, probably can never repay. So on that happy note, what have you got to say for yourself, Michael? Thank you so much, Loretta. You are exceedingly kind. And I want to remind everyone to please stay tuned to the end for the Q&A with Loretta, and you will be able to put your questions into the chat. Uh, we're now going to go to a short film that was produced specifically for this event. Uh, many of you may recognize some of the people that are featured in the film as they have come to Palm Springs and attended the event in the past. At the end of the film, and, and actually during the film, you'll meet Debbie Chantiel and her dog, Honey, and um, we will have a Q&A with her after the film. Uh, most of you know that we've expanded our services. We're not just a guide dog school anymore. We've now uh, gone into training PTSD service dogs for soldiers who've lived through traumatic events and we have um, emotional support dogs for children with autism. 
So during the film, you will see that. And the other thing is in the film, our staff is going to thank Helen specifically for the many years of service and the wonderful good deeds that she's done. But I want you to know that as they thank Helen, they're thanking you because none of this is possible without everybody who's joined us and helped us. And we are eternally grateful. So I'd like to turn it over now and uh, show you the film. I hope you enjoy it. I still have the pictures of us coming back home in 1990 with two dogs, our first born son. I never dreamed by then, that 30 years later, that will be a strong organization that have given new life and independence to almost 700 people and their families around them. I wanted independence. I was a cane user before, and it was exhausting, very exhausting. I was two years in the army uh, when uh, the first Lebanon war started. Two months in the war, I was injured in near to Beirut airport. I lost my sight. I served for five years in the Nahal Brigade. All those experiences continue to impact my life after I finished my army service to a point where the uh, quality of life that I had was not that high. <laughs> 25 years after uh, uh, I lost my sight, uh, I got my sight back after a surgery. It was for a few months. After the high feeling, getting my sight back, I lost it again. And it was very difficult for me, very hard for me. I stayed at home. I left all my activity. I called Noach and I said, Noach, Listen to me, I need a guide dog emerging. <laughs> a guide dog is a life changer to them, to the families, to the surrounding, to the society. And it's not only a change, it's a big, big revolution to, to their lives. My therapist uh, asked me if I wanted to be part of a pilot program. I said, what kind of pilot program? Then she said, you would get a dog in this pilot program. I said, oh. Okay, yes, I'll sign me up for that. Ruby is an angel that is uh, three and a half years old. She is trained to help me with uh, PTSD. Before the PTSD program, all, all the dogs were guide dogs for the blind or emotional support dogs for autistic kids. We wanted to do more. We wanted to give out trained dogs, not only guide dogs, but now service dogs. Since she joined my life, I almost don't have any nightmares. She guards me at night, so it puts my mind at ease. Later, I got a new guide dog. It was Norman. Norman, my fourth guide dog, and Norman helped me or pushed me to coming back to the, to the real, real life. The thing that I like most is obviously working with dogs and people together. Uh, to see the effect uh, the dogs have on the people and how they rehabilitate them and bring them back to society. That's very, very uh, rewarding. Her name is Honey, very sweet. <laughs> she gives me a sense of routine. As a human being, we need routine. And when that changes or something happens, then there's a psychological effect. But Honey has allowed me to maintain a consistency especially when processing the whole situation with the pandemic. Um, my routine hasn't changed. She's, she's just been awesome. She is responsible for at least 50% of me smiling, which is a lot. <laughs> uh, she, look at her. I mean, <laughs> look at her. How you cannot smile, you know. It's, it's... Having that companionship, you know, Having uh, someone there, it really allows you to think about, you know, taking care of another life and not just focusing on your own problems or your own situation. It's a special feeling to be independent. The guide dog gave me the opportunity to be independent, like everybody. Helen, thank you very much for your support. 
uh, with people like you, we will be able to continue to support our great uh, customers uh, with our uh, service and our dogs. Thank you very much. I want to thank you for helping my friends uh, in Betove to help other friends of mine uh, get the treatment they deserve and uh, to better their quality of life. You have given us the, the, the opportunity uh, to be independent, to be like everyone. Although we are so far away, I feel you and I would like to send you a big hug and to thank you for so many years of friendship. You change people's lives by supporting us dramatically. You allow them to get out from the bed and lead life as normal as possible. Thank you very much, Helen, for supporting the center. We wish you great health. None of this would be possible if it wasn't for people like you, so we thank you from the bottom of our hearts. From all of us here in the center, Helen, we thank you very much for all your kindness and all your generosity. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that short film and I hope that many of you get to uh, come to Israel and see it for yourself. Um, as I said earlier, um, hold on one second, we're having just a little technical thing here. Um, nothing we do is possible without the love and support of our friends from around the world. And this past year has been very difficult for us. Uh, COVID shut down uh, the country and our, um, our trainers had to take the dogs to go one-on-one -on -one training people around the country. Um, but I'm very, very proud to report that in spite of the COVID lockdowns and shutdowns, we were able to produce 88 dogs this past year. 88 dogs went to people that with blindness, some for PTSD, and some as uh, emotional support dogs for children with autism. 88 lives were changed in a very profound way because of your help. Um, in the chat area, you should see a link to um, a donation page. If you click on that link, it will come up on your screen. You can minimize it and then come back to it later. Um, I want you to know that last year donations were down and our costs were up because we had to take the dogs one-on-one -on -one to uh, our clients. Um, you know, it, it cost us more to do it. So I'm asking for your help. I'm asking for you to donate again and for um, uh, help Helen get over the million dollar mark. So thank you so much. Please consider making a gift. And now I want to go to Israel live, uh, get Debbie to unmute, and hopefully we can get her on the main screen now and have Debbie tell us a little about herself and how she came to get honey. Take it away, Debbie. Hi, Mike. Shalom, Natula. How are you? I Good. Just speak up a little bit, Debbie. Speak up a little bit louder, please. I'm, I'm, I'm Debbie. I live in Israel. I want to wish everyone uh, a safe and happy time. I hope everyone is doing well. Um, again, I'm Debbie. I am. Uh, I live in Israel, and this is Honey. This is Honey. And Honey and I have been a team for the past since 2018. Um, I lost my sight. Uh, maybe around 2012 or so, uh, late 2012, 2013. And um, I was born with uh, a disease called myopia maculopathy. And this is a combination of, ret of retinal diseases. And these, this disease progresses later in life. So what happened to me in 2013, 2012 ish, 2013, I began to lose my sight. The disease progressed. 
I went to uh, rehabilitation and there I received uh, a white cane, which was the beginning of my, uh, in, uh, my ability to obtain independence. It was a trying time for me because it was such a new uh, situation and it happened suddenly. And it was there during my rehabilitation that I was asked to think about and to consider having a guide dog. Debbie, can you tell us about your very first meeting with Honey? What was it like when you first met? Honey and I met after I had a little hiatus uh, from a previous guide dog. Um, and I had not been with a guide dog for about maybe seven months. I was without a guide dog. During that time, I was mostly cane, um, using my white cane, and it wasn't the same. I was approached and asked, would I consider having a guide dog again? During that time, I wasn't too sure. I was in not such a good psychological state at the time, uh, but I had to really think about uh, my independence. At that point, my activity level had dropped. My independence was not too um, great. My quality of life had suffered. So I said, okay, I'll consider it after much counseling and consideration. And I met Honey for the first time. We went on a walk together. And how hard was it to, to trust Honey and to give control of your life to Honey? How difficult is that? Well, I I'd had previous uh, experience with a guide dog and Honey being uh, new for me, and she was also a girl. Um, it was the difference between like a male and a female dog. Honey was her personality was a little more stronger and it challenged me. Her personality challenged me and that's what I needed at the time. Now, can you tell people how you know when it's safe to cross the street and how you do that? Um, this will be more, more on the side of mobility and it would be, I can compare it to anyone who has had a driver's license and when you go, before you go get your driver's license, you have to have a test, a driver's test. And the guide dogs are somewhat like us when we go get a driver's test, we have to study. The guide dog is trained uh, for us prior to us being um, paired together. So the guide dog is trained to do certain things, just like when we go get our license. When you are with your instructor, or I'm sorry, when you're getting your test, when you're doing your driver's test, you have the, the supervisor on the side and he's grading you. And he tells you to stop at the light, <laughs> correct? He tells you when to stop. He tells you when to turn. Although you know how to do these things, honey is the same way. I tell her, I, I tell her which way to go. I give, I, I give her directions. When she gets to the curb, she knows to stop because she had prior training. So when we get to a curb, she tells me at that point, we're at a curb and she stops. And Tell us a little bit about Honey's personality when she's not working. What's it like in the house? Honey's personality, um, once you take the, uh, the harness off, uh, she's very friendly and she knows the difference between working and resting or playing. She's very active. Uh, she's actually really fun. Um, I can take her out and we have a garden where I live and I can just let her go, it's fenced in, 
and she loves to just run all, all over. And it's so nice to see her free and acting like that when she's as after she's worked. I thought that she was doing the dishes, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, Debbie, my last question for you today is if somebody were seeing you walking on the street or, or out in public, how would you like them to approach you? What's, what's the method that a person who's, who's never met you should come up and approach you? Um, I think that when they approach us or approach me or any guide dog team, I think that the first thing should be to speak to the guide, the person. You know, if you want to approach the dog, if you want to pet the dog, you should uh, first speak to the person, speak to the person who is handling the dog, the guide dog handler. Okay, Debbie, thank you so much. I, I know Noah would like to say a, a brief hello to all of the guests on the, the screen. So thank you again, Debbie and Noah, go ahead and take it for a minute. Shalom for everybody. Uh, Ellen, it was mentioned that about 11 years ago, uh, you lost your grandson, Matthew, you and the family. And you are an amazing grandmother and the whole family that decided to take this tragedy and to transfer your loss into giving so many lives to so many people, heroes like Debbie, who I'm yes. privileged to sit next to her. And this is about 11 years ago. This is the 10th uh, event. But my miracle, very quickly, Mike, started when I met Mike's late parents, Norman and Phyllis Leventhal, and the entire family in the first candle of Hanukkah, 1986. And I'm sure their souls are there up looking at us, and Matthew's soul looking at us and feel us and are proud of us and proud of you, Helen, and all the great people that joined us since uh, 10 years ago for this amazing event. I would like to hug each of you, and I would like to pray for all of you for good health, uh, uh, fighting this virus, and hopefully next year we'll meet again in your home in California, and each of you come and visit us, visit us in Israel, that when the state of Israel is reopened for you. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are about to celebrate Passover in a week. And Passover is very significant because it was the releasing of bondage and it was independence and freedom for our people. So think about that when you think about us and how our dogs allow people to live freely and independently um, and just be able to come and go as they please. And we take it for granted, but these amazing animals are full of heart and they are, have compassion and they have love and they give that to our clients 24 hours a day, seven days a week uh, and for about eight years. So when you give a gift of a dog, it's not just a one-off gift, it's a gift for a, a generation. So uh, thank you again for your support. Please, please consider a gift to us again and keep us in your hearts. And uh, now I'd like to welcome Loretta back and we're going to do a Q&A. So if anybody has questions, uh, please feel free to add them to the chat. But I do have several that have already come in. Okay. Um, the first question, Loretta, was what aspect of animal rights are you most potion, uh, passionate about and most active in? Uh, probably the working animal branch, uh, the dogs in Afghanistan, the military dogs, bringing back uh, them, uh, bringing them back as many as we can. There's a uh, center in Houston for rehab. So, and also, of course, the guide dogs who give life. They literally give life to a person without vision. And uh, I read something the other day that's almost become my mantra: the control center of your life is your attitude. These dogs give that person attitude, a healthy, strong, independent attitude. They can do anything because they have 
the support of that wonderful animal. So I would think those are the uh, uppermost. And of course, I have a little furry family of um, bedroom slipper sized dogs. <laughs> I have a cat who's going to be 20, which is a testament to care, love, you know, and um, I've never met an animal that I don't actually love. I'm talking about, you know, water buffaloes, whatever. Uh, but I would have to say my heart uh, goes out strongly to those working animals who help us and who are uh, not appreciated, but we need to get the word out about them, let people know what we owe them, have, you know, help us help them. Was there a turning point in your life that really turned you on to animals? At what point did you really get involved? I can't remember. I was looking at uh, some photos for the book, my, my art book, and I found this photo of me. I, I don't know, I could be four or five years old on my knees feeding feeding a little dog. Uh, I can't remember a moment in my life when I didn't care about animals. Um, the passion has always been there. The ability to put that passion into action has been uh, tremendously satisfying because it's I feel it's making a difference, like the art book, for example, or, or, or my charity or whatever. But uh, I uh, it's it's most gratifying that as an adult I can take what I have and implement it in a way that helps. Well, let's talk about your art for a second. When what inspired you to begin expressing yourself through art? I have been doodling and sketching and painting since I'm six. And the reason I know that is because my mom, <laughs> bless her heart, uh, my mother uh, the, the thought of it as a child's thing, you know, Loretta's doodling and she's having fun, I'd go out and play. And I was, no, mommy, I want to draw. And uh, one day I found this um, little clipping in a magazine, an art contest, and they, they had a little picture of that you should draw and send in to compete. And I begged her to let me to let me enter the contest. And I won. <laughs> but I have to tell you, it was like a stick figure. We're not talking Rembrandt. And um, she talked about it and said I, I was six years old. So that's how I know that. Uh, and, I, and I've never formally studied, but I'm going to hold up my book now. This is a Bida Wee rescue, by the way. I work with Bida Wee in Manhattan, it's the, our oldest shelter. Henry, I've got light shining it. There you go. I've got my copy here too. <laughs> That's a Bida Wee rescue. I did a painting uh, of that and um, it's now on the cover. I'm working on an extension to the book. Now we're gonna, um, uh, I guess reduce some of the things that are in the existing book and add all the new paintings over the two years the book has been out. Uh, we're going to have a nice fat book, a new cover. And, uh, uh, and I say that because I, I don't want people to walk away saying, well, I have the book. You don't. It'll be uh, more, more and different. Uh, so that is, that is my pleasure. How did it happen? Some uh, a friend of mine saw my paintings and said, that's Wolf. And uh, from from Wolf, <laughs> instead of wow, I started to say woof. And, uh, and it came from the Wolf, one of my best. I do have, um, when you paint, it's like having children. You know, you can't pick a favorite, but Wolf is at the top of the list of favorites. Difficult. I think that's one of the things that makes him a favorite. But anyway, so he was going through my my paintings and he said, you ought to do a book. You should do a book. Do you want to do a book? And I said, yes. <laughs> so so we did a book again. The control center said, yeah, do a book. So uh, we did. And um, I'm I'm almost sold out. Um, I'm clinging to six copies right now. 
and uh, revisiting everything. And the COVID, of course, like everything, impacted us as well. It was put us back a year in getting our, our new book out. So that's, um, that's how that whole thing came to be. And what a, what a wonderful thing to use one passion to help another passion. So I'm pretty passionate. Someone in the chat just asked again about the name of the book. The name of the book is Swit Art, but you see with the heart in there. Yeah. Um, and someone else asked, how did you first meet us? And, and we did say during the speech that she met. Right, uh, over Park. lunch. How, how sophisticated of us. We met over lunch at a vegan restaurant. I don't eat them, I don't wear them, I don't use them, exploit them. I help them, I place them, <laughs> I put them in rehab. I, that's what I do. So I took my, my new best friends to a vegan restaurant and, uh, and fell in love. What can I say? That beautiful woman with that beautiful dog. And I did a kind of stylized painting of the dog and, and it was sold at auction for a thousand dollars. And I said, okay, we're gonna be raising funds for the guide dogs. And so that's how we got connected. It will now go on my list of alliances. It's Sweetheart Animal Alliances. Alliances is the operative word there. We ally with all of our, our colleagues out there and the, the more the merrier, the, the bigger the push, you know, so, so um, that's what I'm looking for. We are grateful for your support. Uh, another question came in, um, how much does it cost for a guide dog? And we didn't bring that up in our speech. Uh, currently a dog costs about $40,000. We say that to sponsor a partnership is 25,000 because that's the raw cost if you take out all of the overhead. But that's, uh, I'm answering the, uh, the oh, and somebody else asked, is the book available to buy? I think she already said she only has six left. Right, we're down, down, down. But you know what you can do? You can um, I get on my website, swidheart.org, S-W-I-T, my name, heart. And uh, you can see if there's anything there that you can order or a friend of mine said they bought a used copy from Amazon. You can maybe trace it uh, that way, but you can put in an order if we're fresh out because there will be another one, I promise you, because it's one of the loves of my life. Uh, it, will, it will be out there. If it means, um, if it's too long a time, I'll, I'll just redo, I'll, I'll reissue this one in a limited number, but I will I will make sure that book gets out there. Do you have a favorite animal that you paint? Is there one particular? I, I it's like asking a woman with five children to say which is that. I mean, there are so many. Oh golly, so many. Um, uh, you're familiar with Hannah Gatsby. She's a very extraordinary woman who really um, broke the ceiling with stand-up comedy by using her emotions and her traumas. And uh, she had uh, two beautiful dogs, water dogs, the really curly, curly locks. And I uh, loved her and I loved the dog. So I did a painting of her dog, Douglas. And uh, yeah, I, Ann, see if you can pull out behind the curtain, see if there's a... Um, is there um, a painting? Yeah, I'm going to show you. This is this is Douglas. Oh wow! Now he's one of the loves of my life because, uh, well, you know, because he's a dog, but also because he was so difficult. <laughs> because he doesn't have the regular dog hair; it's like little curls, like Rastafarians, you know. Um, that would be one. And then we just recently did a um, Give Me a Maggie. Uh, I had a commission which funded my charity to the point where I did so many donations this year to my alliances. This is Maggie. Oh, my. Maggie is one of the loves of my life. And 
Her humans, I never say owners, her humans loved Maggie so much. And uh, they sent me a, a photograph, a framed photograph of Maggie to me. Um, so there's, there's an awful lot of um, personal satisfaction that happens uh, when I, when I uh, give a painting or, or sell a painting or people buy a painting. Uh, and then and knowing that the money is going to all the right places, but um, there is a, a little black and white dog, a cancer survivor that I did a painting of, and uh, the daughter, uh, the, there's a family, the mother and father bought the painting for the daughter, and uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a surprise. So the daughter is also a cancer survivor. So this is a story in itself. And so the three of us, I, I held the, the real model, little Lola, and the family held the painting and we did this, you know, so I said to somebody, you know, ask me what I did this weekend. And they said, what did you do this weekend? I said, I made so many people happy. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Somebody asked in the chat, have you painted your own dogs? Oh, sure. Are you kidding? And my my cats also. Um, uh, well, where do we have? Um, uh, in my bedroom to the right, I did a painting of my big white fluffy uh, cat. She's she's gone now. Her name was uh, unhappily. Her name was Isis, which has such a bad taste in everybody's mouth uh, these days. But. Um, I was very into uh, uh, ancient history and Egyptian history in particular. And so I did a, a big painting of Isis climbing into rose bushes. Did you find it, Ange? It's on the right to the door, the back of the door. Uh, and uh, I, I call it my, <laughs> my attempt at Renoir. And uh, so yes, I paint my animals. Sure, of course, yes, because they're right there for me, you know. Um, animals are not easy. Here's oh, here's my sweetheart climbing up into rose bushes. Oh, uh, how sweet! Was gorgeous, enormous, fluffy. The fluff, the hair. I'm kind <laughs> of constantly eating white hair, but oh my God, she was such a love. And Anubis, you know, I've, I've lost many, many friends over the years, so many, many friends, dogs and cats. And, uh, and of course, I had an extraordinary experience. I did a, um, a, a series called Those Incredible Animals, and I got to one-on-one, -on -one, or sitting on lap, why do you, how would you express that? Anyway, I, I, I met almost every animal on the planet and uh, I have a picture of um, an orangutan hugging me that I treasure. This, she had such a crush on me. Uh, I, um, I've been sitting in this, in, in, in Florida, there's an alligator farm, and I would sit in the pit surrounding by, uh, surrounded by alligators, and my friends would say, you know, why can you do that? I don't know. It never occurs to me that they will hurt me because they have to know somehow that I'm on their side. <laughs> I don't know. Is it Loretta that's like, yes, T. Uh, yes, there I am. So there's me. Yeah, I'm on a pygmy elephant there. And, and there's Patty, a little uh, primate. And um, I'm looking for, go, go this way, I think, a little. Um, go to the other, get, pull, pull. No, nope, no, nope. to up and up and into the right hand corner. No, nope, no, nope. down, down, down. <laughs> oh, there, yeah. there is my sweet orangutan hugging me. That's such a funny story. I'm shooting with her, and the uh, trainer is in the back of the camera watching everything, and she's so entertaining. She's so, I don't want to. Uh, pay her a, a bad compliment here. She's so human. <laughs> She's an orangutan. We're so anyway. So she uh, she was so friendly and, and fun. And uh, 
I, I hugged her and he almost had a stroke behind the camera because he said, you know, Loretta forgets these are animals. No, I don't. <laughs> but, but anyway, uh, I hugged her and she hugged me back. And he said, later on, he told me, he said, Your, their brains are working a little differently than yours, Loretta. She might have interpreted that as an act of aggression. And I said, no, she wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> Loretta, you can't think this way. Yes, I do. I do. And I, I have never had a problem with uh, a wild animal or, a, you know, I just, I have, I don't know what it is. I just think their instinct tells me and I tell them that I love them and I do, you know, but it's, it's a crazy theory out there. Nobody don't do what I do, but uh, it's, uh, it's been a great opportunity for me to be so close to so many animals and it was a wonderful series. I got to uh, talk about all their qualities and their benefits and and their problems and you know um, the endangered species and so forth and what we can do what we're not doing what we should do and um so i've i've had that in my life which is has been wonderful uh there's i want to, to transition but uh, first there's a question do the people pay for their guide dogs the answer is no uh, our yes pay nothing and uh, I rave about that. I mean, what could be better than what these people are doing? They, train, they put all their efforts and all their our money, all our energy, our support into raising these beautiful animals and training them to give life to another human being. And that person comes to them and they say, here, here's your life. This is, this is your new best friend and you can have an, a life now. Get out there and walk around and do things. It's so true. It's, I mean, um, I was involved in a project uh, with delivering wheelchairs uh, and uh, we went to Lebanon and we delivered about I don't know, 25, 50 wheelchairs to people who had never had walking ability and uh you can't you can't wrap your brain around that because you take walking for granted now, i was with a young woman whose life was the ceiling and that's all she'd ever had she was uh, not able to walk, walk since she's a child and uh then suddenly she's placed in this chair and she now has the ability to move and go out. And there, there is nothing like seeing this happen. It uh, uh, transcends any paycheck. Well, let's, let's switch to the different kind of animals, your fans. Now, <laughs> the wild ones. <laughs> you know, I asked Debbie how people should approach her. So I'd like to ask you the same question. If a fan sees you in a restaurant or on the street, how do you like to be approached? Uh, with love. <laughs> um, well, you mean, Bob, I don't mind Loretta. If they call me Loretta, it's my name, Miss Swift. <clears throat> Interestingly, and I get this question from time to time, do they call me hot lips? <laughs> they don't. They call me Major Houlihan. Oh, no kidding. A lot of respect there. I outrank everybody in the room. <laughs> now, seriously, um, after the first season or two, uh, she became much more than just a piece of her anatomy. anatomy. And, um, and that stuck. She became Margaret. Interestingly, even our scripts reflected that because it would say a Hawkeye, Hot Lips, Frank, and so forth. And after the second, third season, it said Margaret. Mm -hmm. She had just taken over herself, became her very valuable self. When I took the role, I made myself a promise. She was gonna be the best damn head nurse in Korea. And that's what I, uh, I kept as my mantra. I, I have a question here from Amy. 
She said, on MASH, you played a powerful woman whose politics and perspective changed over the course of the series. What do you think about the way Margaret Houlihan would make of the women's movement today? Oh, she'd be a leader. <laughs> she, after all, she was a feminist before the word was coined. This was the 50s. I mean, you saw it in the 70s and 80s. We were shooting uh, uh, episodes that occurred in the 50s, and she was quite extraordinary for her time, or at least the way we played her, the way we uh, saw her. And uh, I... Uh, I, I was never, it never failed me to be tickled by Margaret, uh, her flaws, her passions. Uh, I relate to that, of course, because I'm so passionate about things that I care about. She cared about her nurses, her patients, and she was very lonely, always looking for acceptance, and uh, everybody, anybody can relate to that, but certainly an actor who uh, get on stage and, and looks to be accepted, looks for the applause and so forth. But um, then we did shows that showed that, the episodes that showed that, uh, her, her trying to reach out to her dad, her father. And I was a daddy's little girl. I know how important that acceptance is, that love. And uh, my father adored me. Um, Margaret's father would have rather had a boy, a soldier, to become a general. So she had this double whammy to prove to him. Not only was she a good nurse, she was a soldier, you know. <laughs> and uh, it was a joy to play that kind of uh, dynamic. She was also so vulnerable and tender. There is a very famous episode in which she tells the nurses how lonely she is. She doesn't say that, but she says, you don't know what it feels like to walk by your tent and hear you laughing and know that I'm not invited, I'm not wanted. And it's very painful. Here you are in a country that is the hottest place on earth in the summer and the coldest place on earth in the winter. And you're standing in blood, working on patients that are hardly old enough to shave, and there's nothing else but pain and suffering. And you have no friends, and you have to be in charge. You have to yell at them, you have to boss around, you have to do that. You are extremely alone which is, again, the first three seasons are reaching out to a loser like Frank. I hate that word, but a, a ninny. <clears throat> he was inept as a doctor, and he was silly, and he was married. There was no future. So um, it just <clears throat> only shows how very lonely she was. And she was, she was absolutely a joy to play. And uh, <laughs> Larry Gelbart uh, said, uh, Loretta and Margaret always surprise me. <laughs> our choices and how we go out there, what we do, you know. Loretta, that, you just brought me back to that moment and I've got tears in my eyes because I remember the power of that segment and that, and that episode. It, you are truly a, a magnificent actress and it, it really was. was very powerful. I'd like to, we have one last question before we wrap up. Uh, they asked, you've worked with so many incredible actors. Who was your favorite co-star to perform with and why? Oh, gosh. I mean, I worked my colleagues on MASH. They're my family. It doesn't get better than that. I, um, of course, if we had a lineup and say who was your favorite, everybody would say Harry Morgan. He was, he was everything to everybody. For me, my, my friend, my colleague, my, my confessor, my father figure, my, yeah, I mean, he was, and he filled those hats expertly and totally. Um, I, yeah, I, I couldn't, you know, Mike Farrell, <clears throat> I've been calling bro for years. He's been like my big brother. Um, I, 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 Gary Berghoff or Dave, David, you know, uh, David and I had a very special 
bond, a very special relationship because our characters didn't get to work together all that much. But when we did, it was like fireworks. We just loved it. You know, uh, there's, there's no way to, um, yeah, Larry Linville was extraordinary. Shakespeare, um, your battery is running low. Well, we're, we're about to close anyway, Loretta. I want to end by thanking you from the bottom of our hearts for this wonderful, wonderful time. You are- Oh, no, no, are you serious? Thank you. And I can't wait to start doing some more work for this wonderful, wonderful guy. Well, we, we just lost her. Uh, we are so grateful to all of you for joining us today. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of our family. We can't do any of this without you. Um, from the bottom of my heart, I thank you. Our staff in Israel thanks you. And uh, um, I hope you enjoyed today's event. Be well, stay safe, stay healthy. <laughs>